Last week was good, though, with all that food. It really was good. But tonight's good, too. We've been missing y'all. All right, well, whatever the week has brought so far, we're just going to shake it off and give everything we have to God because that's the reason we're here anyways. And so I'm thankful for another day of breathing. I'm alive. I'm well. My family's healthy and whole. I thank God for it. So let's just praise him tonight. God, we love you, and we thank you for another day. You're so merciful. You're faithful. And I just, I can't thank you enough for everything that you've done in my life. I have lived in your goodness. And I thank you, God, that I will continue to live in your goodness just because you're faithful. So, God, we worship you, we honor you, and we praise you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. The beginning and the end. You're the beginning and the end. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same yesterday, today, and forever. I praise your name. I praise your name. You are Alpha and Omega. You are Alpha and Omega. You're the beginning and the end. You're the beginning and the end. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. I praise, I praise your name. Your name. I, praise I praise your name. Your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy, 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 holy. You are worthy, you are worthy of, our of our praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy, 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 holy. You are worthy, you are worthy of, our of our praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
deserve it Still you give yourself away And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God When I was your foe offering time. <laughs> um, I guess we just pray over it, huh? This is new to me. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your many blessings, God. God, we trust in you. Everything that we have is because of you, Father. So on tonight, everyone that gives, everybody that wanted to give, God, just bless their homes, bless their cars, God, bless their jobs, bless their family. And we pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Good evening, everybody. All right, uh, you can go to your classes unless you're in my class. If you're in my class, we're in here. You're stuck in here tonight. So pastor and sister pastor are well on their way to having a nice, well-deserved vacation. And in the meantime, um, we figured we'd do something a little different. My dad and I, if you want to start coming up here, Dad. As a lot of you know, when we went to um, Ukraine this last time, we got to teach together uh, about creation. And I know I've had... I was pretty excited about it, and I talked about it a lot on Sunday mornings and stuff, too. And I had a lot of people tell me that they wanted to hear more about that. And I think he had other people come to him and say that they wanted to hear more about that. So for the next couple of weeks, we figured we would teach a little bit on creation. Because it is very fundamental um, to all of our beliefs. If you don't really understand creation, it's going to be hard to understand the other stuff. So... We'll do a little bit of that tonight. While, you, <coughs> while you're, are we on? <coughs> Hello, we are now, are we? <laughs> while uh, while Brandon's getting his um, stuff set up, uh, I was I was sitting at the house this afternoon after getting off of work and uh, <coughs> thinking about tonight. Uh, you know, you always you always think, okay, I I've studied this, I know, but how 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 do how do you want me to start it, Holy Spirit? How do you want us to start it? And um, I 
in my phone, I have a little place for notes. You, 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 probably everybody has that. Well, I've got this habit of when I have a thought, I get out my phone and I write whatever the thought was. And um, as an example here a few weeks ago, I wrote a thought down and said, uh, there is no comfort in the growth zone. And there is no growth in the comfort zone. And um, now that, forget I said that, all right? Let me, let me go back. Um, I, I, this, this thought come to me. How you're introduced is how you're perceived. How you're introduced is how you're perceived. And uh, that's why when you have speakers, famous speakers, when they introduce them, the introduction is designed for you to perceive that person in a certain way. And I had written this down. At, at, in fact, as the thought came to me, and I couldn't remember exactly how I did it, so I went to my little notepad and went back and thought, maybe I wrote this down. And sure enough, a little over two years ago, I found it in my notes because I always date when I do something like that. And um, so it was there. And so, uh, Brandon, here's the thought. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. He had God's privileged position of introducing God to every person on this earth. And how did, no, how did Moses introduce God? That's how God wants to be perceived. In the beginning, Elohim, creator. In the beginning, creator created the heavens and the earth. And throughout Genesis, we see the word creator again. And creator said, let us do this, let us do that. And so the perception of God as creator is one of the most important perceptions you and I will ever have. And Brennan just said it. If you don't understand the truth of creation, then the rest of your theology is askewed. Because in creation's story is the secret that unlocks everything that God has ever done. And so when God began this process of revealing himself as creator, we have to understand that it's vitally important for us to understand what he said, not what we think. Um, creation is not based upon science. Creation is based upon the word of God. I don't care what science says. If it doesn't agree, if it doesn't agree to the Bible, it's wrong. Doesn't matter. See, if it doesn't agree with the Bible, it's wrong. Evolution is wrong because it doesn't agree with creation story. So, I, I and by the way, on that on that note, we we won't probably be able to get into it in the next two weeks. But uh, if you want to talk about science versus the Bible, I've done a lot of study on that, oh, yeah. and I've got pages and pages of science saying something was right, and then later figuring out, oh wait, this was wrong. It's actually this way. And along with each one of those, I have in the Bible where it says, this is how science works. And it was correct. <clears throat> so not to say science is bad, but we don't know everything yet. We can't that's depend true. on science, but we can depend on God. That's, that's exactly right. What we're going to do as we approach this uh, teaching tonight, not only are you going to hear some things, we, I, I, I'll, I'll guarantee this, Brandon and I will not give you our opinion about anything. We'll only tell you what the Bible says. So in the process, in this journey, we're going to let Scripture interpret Scripture. If it's not in the Scripture, then we're, we, we're not interested. But the Scripture does a great job of... In, so as we go through this, you're actually going to get a feel of one of the best ways to study the Bible. Wow, let there be. I just had an idea. Light. Yeah, <laughs> Brandon just had a, a, an idea. <laughs> uh, well, 
it's I brighter. Yeah, it's yeah, it's brighter. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to have to prop this up just a little bit now. All right, <clears throat> you want to start this, sir? Yeah. W- um, you want to just jump right into this, or do you want to? Oh, yeah, just just have now. As we go through this, you might have questions. You can stop us and ask questions, and yes. we'll let you know if it's something we're about to cover or not. Um, because, like I said, with this, th- we have notes up here for a good solid 15 or 20 hours of teaching. Um, so we're not going to get through everything if tonight. We hurry. But if there's <laughs> but if there's questions that you have, stop us and we'll address those questions. Um, but we can start off uh, if you want by talking about probably one of the. You want to talk about this? Yeah, then? sure. So, <clears throat> one of the more popular religious views that you'll see out there, and honestly, I don't know why it's popular, but it's all, it's, well, I know it's why it's popular, because Satan has uh, put forth this theory to make Christians look stupid, and yeah. that's, that's what's happened, but there's the young earth theory. You guys heard about this? And people, you know, people saying, well, you know, you can't, you can't take anything a Christian says seriously, because they think the earth is less than 6,000 years old. And there are a lot of Christians that are otherwise great people that have good beliefs that believe that. But it's deception. But anyway, what that teaches basically is that the earth was created about 6,000 years ago. And they believe that Noah's flood accounts for the cataclysmic changes in in the earth's surface. They believe that man and dinosaur lived together uh, and that dinosaurs were probably on the ark with Noah if you uh, push them and ask them about them. um, Things like that. But the problem with that is for that to be true, we would have to, um, God would have to be a deceiver. So a fundamental principle of biblical interpretation is take all scripture literally where it's possible to be, to take it literally. Mm -hmm. Um, And if it can't be interpreted literally, you look at the, the, the text and the context and see, you know, Okay, is this written in you know a flowery p- prose? Well, okay, then you know maybe that's a maybe that's that's more poetic language. It's just common sense, straightforward. We make it so difficult to read the Bible, although the Bible was designed to be very, very easily understood by anyone. If it's hard to read, it's because you're making it hard to read. Yeah. So, anyway, that's that's probably the biggest lie that has been perpetuated, um, and there are. I have talked to so many people that just will not give any sort of Christianity a second thought because they say, well, those people are idiots because clearly the earth is more than 6,000 years old. Yeah. Um, so that's where that came from. But um, one of the main things that, that we're going to show you, again, using nothing but scripture, not using opinions or theories or anything like that, just using the infallible word of God, which you have to understand the infallible word of God is in the, its original language. When things get translated into different languages, things can get fallible. So we'll go back to the original language so that we understand exactly what is being said. So if you look at the very beginning of the Bible, um, Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then Genesis verse 2, and the earth was without form and void. Depending on what translation you're looking at, that's what many of them say. So in... uh, In the young earth theory and tradition in general, and most people, you know, reading the Bible in English, um, they're going to see, oh, well, this is this is one this is one sentence. This is just talking about, you know, one thing. So we have to go back to the original languages and see what's actually being said here. Um, Yeah, let me let me just put in this this thought uh, Brandon first of all we're, we're going to we're going to actually dig into verse two first yeah but let me go back to verse one just for a moment in the beginning not six thousand years ago it doesn't say in, in six thousand years ago God created the heavens and the earth it said in the beginning so we have to identify that as the dateless past because we don't know the Bible doesn't tell us what it is God created the heaven and the earth now your King James text uses the singular word heaven the Greek, uh, the Hebrew word is plural. So he created the heavens and the earth. The Hebrew word for earth is dry land. Dry land. 
So he created the heavens and he created dry land. Now we go to verse 2. Eretz is the original yeah, word. Yeah, Eretz is, is, is the word for earth there. and It can't be translated anything other than dry land. That's, I mean, there is no other, there's no deviation of that. So when God created the earth, he created dry land. Now in verse 2, we find the dry land is not dry. And this new earth theory that we're talking about, the earth being 6,000 years old, said when God created the earth, he created it in chaos. And then he fixed it. But now, let me just throw one question out before we go any further. If verse 2 shows, and verse, uh, verse uh, two shows that the earth is flooded with water, darkness was upon the face of the deep, then the question arises, where did water come from? Because there is no place in Genesis that God created water. And people will start looking for that because it's pre there's pretty detailed creation story in there. But nowhere in Genesis will you find God created water. So where did water come from? Well, it had to be created sometime, someplace. We find it in other places of the scripture, but not in Genesis. So we have dry land covered with water, but we don't know how the water got there from chapter 1 verse uh, in Genesis. So that's where we're going to go. All right, my man, let's do it. You're going to start talking about uh, Tohu and yes. Wohu? Yes. Okay. So this is another pair of, of Greek words that are pretty Hebrew. important. Hebrew words, I'm sorry, <laughs> that, are that are very important. And we, we have to understand what they mean. So that phrase, without form and void, in English. One, one second. Now, when we are talking about Hebrew words, please understand you have access to find what the Hebrew words are if you're looking at King James Bibles. So, Brandon, real quickly, can you give us a couple of places where these people can go and get a free? Yeah. So. Um, um, Strong's. Yeah, so uh, Blue Letter Bible is a good one. It's easy to use that I've talked about before. You can get to it on a computer at blue le blueletterbible.org. There's apps for, uh, for iPhone, for Android, for anything like that. There's a number of other ones as well, but um, that one works really well, and it's free, and, um, and I'm familiar with it, so if you guys want to start using it and you have questions about it, I'll be your technical support on it. Also well. remember... When you get into these apps and they try to define these words, be careful with the definitions because we want Scripture to define itself because many people who define some of these words and do commentaries on them are going back by opinions, not necessarily what the word says. So we're going to tell you how to find exactly how the word's used because sometimes Strong's will give you a smorgasbord of possibilities. And so we have to, okay, which one do we choose? Well, we're going to show you that as we go. All right? Okay, so that phrase, without form and void, that's made up of two Hebrew words, tohu and behu. One is without form and one is, is void. And it's used elsewhere in the Bible. So tohu, which is, without, which is rendered here as without form, uh, and the idea is emptiness or waste. And it's used 19 times in the Old Testaments. In the Old Testament, and every time it's translated with uh, empty or vain or vanity, it's vain and vanity is often how it's yes. translated. Mm -hmm. And then the word void is bohu, and that's found only in one other place in Scripture, and that's Jeremiah 4.23, which says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. Yes. Now, again, you mention, uh, he mentions where these words are found. So when you, when you look at how these words are found in other scripture, that gives you an understanding of how the word is used in the Bible. All right? So rather than being a formless mass lacking creative definition, Moses is painting a picture for us. He's being very specific. He's, being, uh, he's, he's, not, leaving, he's not leaving anything to the imagination here. He's being very explicit. This is b a barren waste that's desolate. There's no other way to take that. It's, it's, uh, there's no pristine void uh, that anxiously awaits the creator's touch. 
uh, that's just not something that happens. This is the result of something, and in fact, some, some English versions um, of the Bible will say, and the earth was, l was laid waste. Yes. And that's a pretty good translation of it. Mm -hmm. um, so this is not something that's a blank slate. This is something that has been annihilated. Yes. <clears throat> and then you read in Ecclesiastes 3.11, you, you, you see uh, something interesting here. Uh, Solomon writes here, he said, he has made everything beautiful and appropriate in its time. So if we're to think that God created the earth without form and void, if God were to create the earth in, a, in, in an annihilated state, well, then we've got a, we've got a contradiction here. Yes, we do. Because it says, he has made everything beautiful and appropriate in its time. Something that's desolate and made waste is not beautiful, and it's not appropriate for a creator. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> and then you see Isaiah forty-five eighteen says, "Thus saith the Thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God Himself that formed the earth and made it, He hath established it, He hath created it not in vain." And that's that same word to who, vain. He so He didn't create it without form. That's right. That's what this is saying literally. He created it not in vain or not into who. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. So using that exact same word, to who, directly contradicts the traditional understanding uh, of, you know, the young earth theory of putting verses one and, and two together. Or, for, yeah, putting verses one and two together and saying that God created the world to be this way. And then... This text is also interesting because it contains two other words which are vital components to forming an accurate interpretation of this material. And uh, that's the word created. And it uses both of these words, uh, or uses the word created twice, and the word is bara. And you've heard, you've heard us talk about that word a lot before. Mm -hmm. And in Genesis 1-1, actually, uh, in the beginning, God created, God bara, the heavens and the earth. So the use of bara throughout the old uh, the Old Testament it indicates a new creation, bringing things into existence without having to use anything else. In other words, you're not creating something out of something else. You're creating something out of nothing. That's what bara means. Yeah, Hebrews eleven three actually states it through faith. We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now this tells us that the actual substance God used to create the material universe was his spoken word. Not material, but his spoken word. So, so uh, uh, when, when, we, when, when we look at this, physical matter was a result of a spiritual utterance. The visible was fashioned from the invisible. This is the reason Jesus is called the Word in John chapter 1, verse 1. And verse 3 in John chapter 1 states, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now let me go back to Elohim just a minute. The Hebrew word Elohim in Genesis 1 and 1 the word Elohim is a plural word, always plural in the Hebrew text. So uh, you get on down in verse 28 and it says, And God said, or Elohim said, let us. He didn't say let me, let us. So Elohim includes the triune Godhead, which we know as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now, we, they, they weren't that back then, but that's what they are now. That's what we recognize. Uh, now, so uh, bara, anytime you see the word bara, it always means to take something that didn't exist or to make nothing and make something out of nothing. Now, uh, the other key word that we're going to be looking at is the word asa, and that's also used in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, it makes, makes its first appearance in verse 7. 
Now we're going to get in and we're going to show you the difference in these words <coughs> and how they use, but I, I want to, we want to introduce those to you first. Um, in, in verse 7 it says, And God made the firmament. And God made the firmament. Now he didn't create it in Genesis 1-7, but he made it. So we're going to explain this word Asa. Now, Asa and Bara are alike in meaning, uh, are not alike in meaning or significance, even though both refer to acts of creation. It's often found that light is shed upon the fundamental meaning of a word by noting the way in which it is first used in Scripture. With this principle in mind, a clear distinction emerges between bara and asa, <coughs> a distinction which is both deepened and sustained throughout Scripture. So Brandon's going to take us right into the distinction of bara. So in Genesis 1, bara, or Genesis 1 verse 1, God bara, uh, the heavens and the earth. Uh, going down to Genesis 1, verse 21, he, this, this is also how the sea creatures and the fowl were created. Then verse 27, God created man in his own image. God bara man in his own image. <clears throat> and then in Genesis 2, verse 3 and 4, it's used to summarize God's creation of man. In Genesis 5, verse one, verses 1 and 2, it's used to uh, introduce the genealogies. Genesis 6, verse 7, it's used in context of uh, regret. Deuteronomy 4, verse 32, it's used again, uh, talking about man's creation. Psalm 51, 10, this is David's prayer. You know, uh, you've heard this, create in me a, a clean heart. That word create there is bara. Um, and then quite a bit in Psalms. Psalms 89, verse 1 and 2, verse 47, Psalms 1 or 2, 18, this goes uh, on and on. <coughs> so in, in contrast to bara, which is found 54 times in the Old Testament, asa is used even more, uh, and that's used two, over 2,600 times. So the difference here is asa doesn't have the creative power of bara. Right. So asa also means created, but it means to, to make something out of something else, but there's other nuance to it as well. Uh, this is a word that suggests appointment rather than creation. This is assigning something. So um, let's say you're in the military and you get, a, you, you get a promotion, you're in the army and you get a promotion to general, and they say, well, uh, he was made a general. He wasn't created a general. Uh, they did. He wasn't taken apart with some other pieces and put together to to become a general. He was assigned that role and given those responsibilities and given those uh, abilities and everything that goes along with it. That's kind. Of, that's that's the uh, <coughs> that's the the nuance here that we're dealing with with Asa. Mm -hmm. So when we see. Uh, the firmament was, uh, was, was made in just Genesis 1, verse 7. It was appointed to its task. It was, it was told at that point, your job now is to divide the waters. So it was already there, but it didn't have a purpose yet. And so it was assigned its, its new job of dividing the waters. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then, uh, let's see, that's... Uh, it could be, yeah, because God had already created the heavens and the earth, and so He's saying this, this firmament divides the heaven and the earth. In v verses fourteen through eighteen, same same kind of thing. It also has the idea of accomplishment uh, in Genesis three thirteen and fourteen. I don't have those. Yeah, so Genesis 3.13, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Is that right? Three, yeah. That's it. 
three thirteen. Three thirteen. Is that it? And fourteen. Yeah. And fourteen. And God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast has done this, thou thou art cursed above all the cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. Yeah, so that that's that's uh, because of what they did, the the accomplishment created the, the curse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, in creativity, so like in Genesis one. Uh, ge- sorry, Genesis 11, verse 4. And they said, uh, go to, let us build a city and tower whose top may reach to heaven. This is the, the Tower of Babel. And let us make a name lest we be scattered abroad in the whole earth. When they said, go, let us build a city, that's that same word, a saw. Yeah, it's the, the, yeah, the, the word build is create. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. You can probably... Deuteronomy 8.18. Let things. me just throw out Deuteronomy 8.18, one of my favorite scriptures. Uh, reading from the King James text, remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant. Remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. Uh, The word get there is the Hebrew word asa. So what God has done, he's given you and I the power, the, the, the ability or capability to get wealth. Now, how do we get it? We create it by our skills or our creativity. Uh, you know, you, you may do arts and crafts and sell it. You may be a painter like Ashley and paint a, uh, a painting and, and sell it for a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, okay. Uh, but that's, that's how you do it. Uh, you may be a photographer. And you create wealth by, by doing quality photography and you sell your product. So there's so many ways we all, I mean, I cre- you can create it by just going to the job and working every day. Uh, and you're exchanging time for money. So that's a process of creating wealth. All of that is this, this creativity, the idea of accomplishment. When I accomplish something, I can turn that into wealth. So this is the word... I mean, 2,600 times in the Bible, in the Old Testament, uh, you can see that there is multiple uses uh, of this word of Saul. And this is one of the major words that God uses here uh, as he gives us insights into Genesis chapter 1. Okay, so we've talked about bara and Asa and Tohu and Bohu. And with now that we know those, we can look at a scripture like Isaiah 45, 18, and know what it's saying here. For thus saith the Lord that created, bara, the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, Asa, he hath as, has established it. He created, bara, it not in vain, to who? He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. So understanding that bara refers to the original creation we can clearly see that God did not originally create the earth in vain or without form, as described in Genesis 1-2. Something had to happen to produce those results. Now, let me throw this in also, Brandon. Here in, in Isaiah, when God barred the earth in the beginning, in the dateless past, God barred the earth. And in Isaiah, uh, simply tells us very clearly that he formed it to be inhabited. So it didn't stay barren for hundreds and thousands of years. Nope. He created it. It was to created be with a purpose. So that scripture tells us that there was earth subjects on this earth pretty quickly after God created it. Not six thousand years ago, but who knows when in the dateless past. All right, you want to talk about Hayah? <coughs> yes, Genesis so 1. So Genesis 1-2, and, and the earth was without form and void. So this is more than just a state of being. This We're is looking at the word that was? Y- yeah, which is Hayah. Yeah. Uh, and the earth was without form and void. So it's that word was. doesn't seem like a big deal, right? It is a big deal. <laughs> um, and that word is Hayah. So um, 
it's more than just a state of being. This suggests a process of becoming this way. Yes. So a, a great way, like you, like Dad was talking about earlier, if you want to see what a word means, you go and find that other word uh, in Scripture, uh, especially as if you can find, you know, from the same time period or the same author or s- s- things like that where context is shared, then you get a real good idea. Uh, just like, you know, we tend to use the same words when we mean to say something specifically. And I like what you said. When you have the same author using the same Hebrew word mm-hmm. and using it in different form, uh, different uh, ways, that lets us understand the meaning of that word. Very much so. So uh, if we look at other, other examples of Hayah, we've got Genesis 2, verse 7. So again, this is by the same author. Uh, and it's talking about man became a living soul. Became. So that, that word became is haya. That's exactly the same word that we have translated as was in, in verse 2. Uh, Genesis 19.26, again, same author. Lot's wife became a pillar of salt. That word is also haya. And here it's became instead of was. And then Exodus 4, 3, verse 4, again, same author. Moses' rod became a serpent when he picked it up. And when he picked it up, it became a rod in his hand. All of these instances are using that exact same word that was rendered was in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Now, this is the problem with translating scriptures uh, in different languages. There's so many challenges in doing this, and it's a monumental task you know, that can take decades, but there is no perfect translation. No, no matter how transparent you try to be, you're never going to be able to translate things perfectly. And that's why it's so important to go back to the uh, original text. Um, if you hear people talking about, well, you know, I just can't put any faith in the Bible because it, contra- it contradicts itself. I can promise you there is absolutely no contradiction in the Bible in its original languages. No way. That's right. The only contradictions that anybody will ever be able to find are contradictions that are created by humans in putting their own ideas into things. And that's why when we're doing this, that's why he said at the very beginning, there's not going to be any opinions. We're only going to use the original language. So when we see Moses using the word became uh, almost exclusively in his other writing, and we didn't give all those scriptures here, then it would be, uh, we wouldn't be doing injustice to, to, to change the word was to became. And the earth became, became. without form and void. Absolutely. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And that lines up with, with the other things that we already see. Uh, dry land became flooded. Mm-hmm. So it, it wasn't was flooded. It right. became flooded. All right. Yeah, and, and if we're going to say that, and the earth became without form and void, we've already d- covered in Isaiah, uh, clearly states that it wasn't created that way. So... There is only one way to interpret this. Genesis 1, verse 1, and Genesis 1, verse 2, there's stuff that happens in between. Yes. A bunch of stuff happens in between, actually. Um, But it's not not part of the same thought. That's just a a a failure in translation. It's a gap. Yeah, we have a gap. But how many years, we don't know, do we? No idea. Now, we do, if we get, if we might have time to, to talk to it, but we do have some ideas of what was going on there, and hopefully we'll get to some of that, of some of the things that were going on there. Yeah, because it's really interesting. It's really interesting. Yeah, the fact of the matter is, Brandon, if we just, if we just deviate right yeah, now, yeah, yeah, so. if we just took a deviation right now, and let's, let's talk about Lucifer for just a moment. <coughs> <Yep>. uh, <coughs> because... In Genesis 1, uh, in the first few chapters, we find that there is an entity, an evil entity, uh, trying to deceive. By the way, if you want to have a whole lot of fun with, with, with people that, you know, that, that, that study the Bible or, and, and that are Christians, if you just want to be mean to them, uh, ask them. You know, God, crea- God created the... Uh, a world without sin, right? Adam and Eve were in the garden before sin. Everything was perfect, right? That's right. Except Satan 
is in there. Where did that come from? Yeah. Did God create a perfect a perfect world with no sin? And 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 did he throw Satan in there to just throw a wrench in things? And get and, get him to explain that. It's fun. You'll get and, some good and, answers. And why does and, and why does God tell Adam and Eve to guard the garden against what? Against who? Interesting, right? I mean, class, that's some, t- some some tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> and God specifically said, "Guard the garden." That's the word keep. The Hebrew word for keep is the word to guard, to protect. From who? From what? <laughs> well, the Bible tells us. All right. <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of people ask the question, uh, was sin present before Adam's first appearance upon the scene? Um uh, when did sin first appear? I, 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 I like to think about evil peeking over God's shoulder during the six days of creation. <laughs> Just can't hardly wait until God gets it done because after all, he was the ruler of the earth at one time and, and, and suddenly light has come on on this planet that's been in, shrouded in darkness for who knows how long. And each of those acts, when, when God, at the end of every day, it was pronounced good and perfect. Good and perfect. <laughs> good and perfect. Yes, and somebody's trying to change that, aren't they? Yeah. Take us to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, verse 4. Uh, we hear a little bit about Lucifer's earthly kingdom. So in this text, it's, it's written as a proverb against, uh, against the king of Babylon. Now, let me pause you a minute. All of our studies is done at the King James text. So if you're looking at any of this and any other translation, it, it's not going to work. Uh, but it, the King James text is, is the way we access the original languages. All right? Yeah, so starting in Isaiah 14.4, f- uh, it starts out, thou, uh, thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. So it says right off the hand, right, right off, right off hand, it's it's a proverb. So we know that this is not, uh, we know that this isn't literal. We know that these statements can't be possibly made against an earthly king. So this is what we've got here as an example of parallel writing. So this is writing that's true and it can be literal, but it's but it's written in parallel as a proverb. Shani, to take us to verse twelve. I, all right. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heavens. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. All right? Okay. Now the Hebrew word that's rendered as Lucifer there is uh, Hillel. Guess what that means? Light bearer. He's characterized as the son of the morning in verse 12. Uh, so we know that we're not talking about an earthly man. We're not talking about the, the actual king of Babylon here. We're talking about Lucifer. This is what's called the, the, the law of double reference. Now, <coughs> let, me, let me just talk about the law of double reference just for a moment. We have a prime example of that when Jesus is talking to the disciples, and um, and uh, he's got them gathered around, probably around Benias or Philippi, uh, uh, Caesarea Philippi, up up close to Mount Hermon, and um, he's asking who who, who do they say that he is, and Jesus uses the term. He says that he's going to. 
will go die. And Peter says, get behind me. Not, no way. No way. And Jesus looked at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Was, now, was Jesus calling Peter Satan? No. He recognized that Peter was being influenced by Satan to say what he did and trying to uh, keep Jesus from fulfilling the will of the Father. And so this is the law of double reference. Jesus is talking to Peter, but he's addressing somebody else. So we have this law of double reference. It's used several times in Scripture. This is one of the examples. Uh, when we have this prophecy to one person, but no earthly man could do these things uh, that, that we have said about this person. <coughs> so we know that it's talking about Lucifer. Um, only found one time in Scripture. Now that's very important for us to know because he's no longer known as Lucifer. He was Lucifer before he sinned. But now he's Satan. So the use of Lucifer is, is, I mean, just don't use that term if you're talking about the devil. Because that's not his name anymore. And to call him that is to give him back the, 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 the position that he once had before the fall. And we shouldn't give any credibility to that whatsoever. Okay, Brian, I'm sorry I interrupted you. So those no, you're good. So those two verses that Dad just read, there's some really, really interesting things to consider in there. So we know now that there's a gap between Genesis verse one and two. We know that there's a lot of stuff that happened in in that gap. And so if we go to Genesis verse three, when when uh, Satan shows up as a as a, a serpent to tempt. Eve and to put the, and to put them in sin. We know that this story is also happening before uh, the Garden of Eden, and there's some interesting things in here. So how art thou fallen fallen from heaven? So we know that Lucifer, when he was Lucifer, he was in heaven. He was fallen from heaven. That were cut down to the ground, and that ground is suggesting uh, the earth, literal ground which weakened the nations. Not that, the nations we know today. I told you that's interesting, right? <laughs> Did you know that there were nations before the Garden of Eden? The Bible says there is. Yes. There was. Yes. That's, that's pretty, pretty crazy. <clears throat> so in, that, in that, little, that little two verses there, in that little story, we've got five times where Lucifer said, I will. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon, uh, sit also uh, upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the, the heights of the clouds. I will be more, uh, be like the Most High. Let me pause this a moment, Brian. We've got five minutes left. Oh, yeah. Because school starts tomorrow, we're going to make sure that we get you out of here on time. Uh, but let me give you, because doctrine is based upon two or more scriptures. So let me just, uh, if you're taking notes, write down Ezekiel 28, verses 12 through 19. This is also uh, Ezekiel's description of Lucifer and, and um, his position and what happened to him. So we have it, uh, we, we just gave it to you in Isaiah, uh, and this one is in Ezekiel. And, and so we're, 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 going, we're going to stop right here. Uh, and when we come back next week, we're going to talk about darkness upon the face of the deep. So uh, um, what we, I would like to do is just with the next four minutes, is there any questions that anybody uh, would like to ask or any comments? Yes, ma'am. Ezekiel uh, 28, uh, verse 12 through 19. <laughs> All right. Is this interesting? <laughs> it is deep. We talked for a while, and 
really got past that. But <laughs> let, let me, yeah, let, let me let me tell you this. Somebody says, well, uh, demon spirits are fallen angels. No, that's not true. Uh, fallen angels uh, have bodies. Demon spirits do not. So where do demon spirits come from? Well, they came from Lucifer's world. When he was overthrown and all those earth subjects died, that's where demon spirits, they became disembodied spirits. So they're a part of Satan's kingdom now. And But that's why they can enter because a fallen angel cannot enter another person, but demon spirits can. And we have a Bible record of as many as a legion in one person. Yes, ma'am. No, no. The fallen angels are not the Nephilim. The Nephilim were, the Nephilim were a product, product of fallen angels and natural man. That's, they were the giants. Yes. Yes. Yeah. There was there, there there was an entire society. Yes. Yes. And and we'll we'll get into that too. But whenever it, whenever it's ref whenever the world that then was is referred to, it's referred to with the Greek word cosmos. Yes. Which doesn't mean planet. It means a social system. Social system. Nations Gover government peoples. and and we'll also show scriptures that talks about kings, kingdoms, uh, a whole, a whole, whole thing. Yeah. So the world that then was, which is identified in New Testament in Peter's writing, was was similar to this world here. There were there were cities, cities, nations, kingdoms, but it was ruled by Lucifer. He was he was the the he was the <laughs> world ruler. Right. Yeah. No, 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 not at that time. We not don't yet. know we don't know how long he ruled before he <laughs> fell. See, the Bible doesn't give us that information of how long he ruled before he fell. The whole thing's kind of a bizarre. But it tells us the process of falling and what happened. He was lifted in pride. Yep. He was trafficking in things that didn't belong to him. Uh, and and that's not part of our study. So we're not going to get into all that detail, but but what we have to understand is is that there was a social system on this earth and because of rebellion and because of the lack of a plan of redemption, that whole society perished. And that's where demons came and from. And that's where demons come from. That's where fossils, that's where the dinosaurs lived. All of that and stuff. And cavemen. Uh, yeah. All that kind of stuff. All the stuff that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got one right here now. Yes, ma'am? This is before Adam. Yes, yes. ma'am. This is before Adam. Yep. Genesis chapter 1 is the story of recreation, not, not yeah, the story not of creation. Yeah. It's the story of recreation. All right? Now, one reason we don't have more said about the world that then was and what we do is because we don't need to know more. But there is enough that we can... Prove it scripturally without a doubt. And, it, it, the, and what we do know, what God has given us, gives us insight to what we're facing now with the kingdom of darkness and what his plan and purpose. Satan wants to take over the world. He wants to become world he wants ruler to get one more time. Back to where he was. Yes. Many planet. nations. Many uh, nations. He, 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 he ruled the entire planet. And then the earth was laid waste. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that. And then you're in Genesis, first, uh, Genesis 1, verse 2. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so what happened between the creation was God placed Lucifer on the earth, uh, he was the earth ruler of subjects, kingdoms, and so forth, and people, because God created the, pe the earth to be inhabited. And, and so for, we don't know how many 
years. I mean, science may tell us be millions of years. Millions of years. Well, that's, I have years. no problem with Whatever. that because I, God's eternal. Mm -hmm. He's always been. So somewhere in the beginning, he did that. So all of those eons of years, you say, well, how, how can you put that many people on the earth? Did you realize that if you could take every single person, 8 billion people that's living on this earth right now, give them two square feet to stand on, and they would not fill up the city limits of Jacksonville, Florida. True. And we say we're overpopulated. <laughs> And just think, when the earth is going to, the earth is 70% water now. When it's going to be restored, it's not going to be 70% water. There's going to be four rivers that's going to water the entire earth, flowing out from the throne of God. You say, well, how can that be? Well, just stay, <laughs> stay right with God and you'll see. <laughs> Amen. God bless you tonight. Uh, we, we, we hope that um, we, you've enjoyed this. Uh, and uh, write some questions down. That's okay. Next week we'll come back and we'll do it again. All right? Praise the Lord. Look at one another and smile real big and say, God bless you. And go in God's favor. Sleep well. Amen.